Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this panel on the rules and methods of interpretation of international human rights and humanitarian law. You might notice that we are uh, slightly a smaller panel than advertised. We will have our first panelist beam in from somewhere, <laughs> Professor Albuquerque uh, from cyberspace, but I understand at the moment he's lost in cyberspace and he might be recovered. We hope he'll be recovered shortly. But in the meantime, uh, the other panelists have kindly agreed to proceed and then we'll make space for Professor Albuquerque when, when he is discovered uh, somewhere on the planet. <laughs> but uh, thank you to the organizers for this wonderful conference. It's a great treat to be here and to have such an inspiring launch uh, in Judge Jimile's wonderful keynote lecture. So I think we're set up with some of the very big questions we need to consider. And we've got a marvelous panel here today. I'll introduce each of them just shortly before they speak. And uh, so Ellen Polinczynski has kindly agreed to begin. Uh, Ellen is currently a legal advisor to the commentary update unit at the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva. And uh, Ellen's had a very interesting career. I won't read out the lengthy, uh, well, the biographies of everybody, but she has, uh, I had the great good fortune of knowing Ellen in her previous role, which was to be, she was the critical engine, I think I can say, of the International Committee of the Red Cross Review. So it's a great pleasure to see her again in her new capacity. So Ellen, I'm just going to, without further ado, hand over to you. And what we'll do with our two speakers who are present, I think if you have questions, perhaps we'll save them up for the end for a discussion. But with Professor Albuquerque, he's requested that uh, questions be posed immediately after, after his talk. So uh, with your indulgence, I'll invite Ellen to speak to us. Welcome, Ellen. Great, thanks, Hilary, and thanks very much to the organizers. I'm, I'm excited to be here with you today and, and to talk to you a little bit about the interpretive methodology we've been using. Um, I'm gonna, just to give you an idea of how I'm gonna use my time, I'm gonna talk a bit about the International Committee of the Red Cross's relationship with international humanitarian law to give you a sense of, of why we feel entitled to and even compelled to interpret this body of law, especially its core treaties, the Geneva Conventions, um, and then I'll go pretty quickly, I'll get into the history of the ICRC's legal commentaries on these core conventions, the methodology behind them and, and who is writing them and why. And then I'll get into our current project to upside, update the commentaries, which we're using the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties interpretive um, articles, articles 31 through 33 as our interpretive, as our, as our methodology. Um, so without further ado, I will get into these Five Guys, the original Committee of the Red Cross. Um, and interestingly, it sort of mirrors our functions today. Those are two war surgeons at the bottom, uh, a lawyer and a former general who fought in the Swiss Civil War, who performed sort of the, the think tanky political functions and the money guy, the fundraiser, Henri Dunant. And um, this really goes back to him. He was, as you may have heard, the legend of the birth of the Red Cross and sort of how we trace modern humanitarian law um, back to the 18, 1800s. And I'm, I'm very glad that, that Judge Ziamelli emphasized the importance of going back to the beginnings. Um, he witnessed this battle of Solferino in 1859 and saw these women from nearby the nearby village of Castiglione organized to evacuate and care for the wounded soldiers from the battlefield. And he thought, what a great idea. So he stole it and wrote a book uh, published in 1862, A Memory of Solferino. And this is important for us today because of the three proposals he made in the book and, and how they evolved. So the first was that there be societies organized already in peacetime to perform that function, to evacuate wounded and sick from the battlefield and to care for them. That the second proposal that they be identified by some sort of emblem, uh, which became the Red Cross, the Red Crescent and the Red Crystal. And that there be norms set up to protect those people, a body of law that became international humanitarian law. So he published that book in 1862. He shopped it around to all his friends, raised some money and got this gang together who drafted the initial 
uh, Geneva Convention, pitched it to states, and it was concluded in 1864. So you can see that the multilateral system was certainly quicker back in the day. Um, so then we get to this guy on the top left, Gustave Moignet, who at varying points of his career claimed differing degrees of authorship of that initial convention. Initially, he said that it was him and General Dufour together who did the first, first draft. Um, and later in life, he claimed sole authorship, which explains why he felt so entitled to write the ICRC's first commentary on the Geneva Convention of 1864, which he published in 1870. So this was shortly after the commentary or the, the, the first Geneva Convention had been concluded, but not so shortly that there was no practice. Um, he was writing during the first official implementation of this Geneva Convention in 1870 during the Franco-Prussian Franco War as the war was really ongoing because the law was coming under pressure. Um, it had previously been applied in spirit by countries who were party to it, but the other party of the conflict wasn't necessarily party to the convention. This was the first time it was being applied de jure and it wasn't being entirely respected. So the law was coming, coming under pressure and he felt a need to explain how it should be interpreted. And his methodology can be briefly summed up as, I was there, trust me. So he, as the person who'd done the first draft and as a person who was in the room for all the negotiations felt that he was able to expand on the intent of the drafters. He also felt completely at liberty in a way that's, that's sort of hard to understand today to, to, to propose Lex Veranda and to say, this is how the law should develop and you should already start doing it um, without footnotes. So that, because of his involvement, because of his reputation at that stage, he was also the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross and had served various other high profile international roles. He relied on his reputation to give credibility to his interpretation of the law. And, and that was really, and, and the standards of, of academic rigor at the time accepted. So that was the first, and then moving on to this, the 1906 convention, this is the first time that the Geneva Convention was revisited um, and reconcluded. Uh, and here, this time, the main drafter of the convention, Louis Renault, issued the report of the drafting committee as a commentary immediately after the convention was concluded. So the interpretation here was really, this is what we intended because here's the report. Um, Two years later, in 1908, uh, a representative of the, of the Swiss Red Cross, which is distinct from the ICRC, but very related, um, produced another commentary. He, this, this was a, another prominent professor, both were professors, and in really all of the advertisements and, and promotion of these two commentaries, it was emphasized that they were eminent professors and again, it was their reputations that provided the credibility for these commentaries. And they weren't, neither were authored explicitly by ICRC personnel, but they were really endorsed by the ICRC and these professors were sort of serving as, as proxies. And the ICRC itself had a great credibility because again, it was there for the drafting, it was providing drafting support and was seen as, as, a, as an authority in that way. Um, in 1929, when the Prisoners of War Convention was added and the previous Geneva Conventions were revisited again, um, the ICRC produced again a commentary in 1930, again by one of the main drafters of the first draft of the convention, this time an ICRC lawyer, Paul de Gout. And his, his methodology was still, I was there, but the credibility was less based on his own personal reputation, more based on the institutional reputation. And we see that because there was an, an introduction written by the ICRC's president at the time, Max Hubert. And in the way that this was, was communicated publicly. Um, so he still was explaining the drafter's intent, um, but now it was more of an institutional push, push than a reputational push on why anyone should listen to the ICRC on this matter. So that brings us to 1949 and the Geneva Conventions as we know and love them today. Uh, so 
These conventions, it was still an article by article explanation of the intent of the drafters, again, written by people who were there, but this time written by a, a group and not by an individual. This group was made up of, of seven ICRC lawyers who had all been part of the ICRC delegation to the diplomatic conference and who'd all been involved at various stages of the documents produced in preparation, the various draft commentaries, et cetera. Um, but interestingly, they brought on one external expert who actually was Dutch. Um, so he was a, a member of a judge at the Dutch Court of Appeals and a, a former naval captain, Major M.W. Mouton. Mouton. Um, and I think this goes to show that IHL lawyers have always been a little bit uncomfortable in the law of the sea. <laughs> um, so here, these were again people who had all been there. They were relying on their own experience in the room, but also their own experience as ICRC delegates in the Second World War. And they were saying, these are the problems we saw, and this is the solution we proposed, and this is why states did or did not adopt our proposed solution, <laughs> but you should still go with our view. Um, it's the first time, notably, that guidelines were issued for how these commentaries should be drafted, perhaps because it was a, a collective effort instead of an individual work this time, but also academic standards were evolving and a little more rigor was being required. So these guidelines, importantly, explicitly stated that unlike previous commentaries, this was not to be the opinion of the commentator. So. They say, uh, the, the, the lead editor, Jean Pictet, said, if the author of the commentary has opinions to which he, notably he, would like to give more per a more personal touch, he will mark them clearly in the margins. And this was an emphasis that it was no longer just, I was there, trust me, but I was there, and I'm going to show you the work of why you should trust this interpretation. This time, the credibility of the commentary did not rely on the authors. And this is important to note because over time, these became known by the name of the lead editor on the project, Jean Pictet, as the Pictet Commentaries. But at the time of drafting, he wasn't the Jean Pictet that you may have heard of. He wasn't so famous. He was, he was a lawyer. He'd been involved in the, in the uh, diplomatic conference, but he wasn't the head of the ICRC's delegation to the diplomatic conference. He was just starting out his career in international law. And so it's interesting that these became known as the peak day commentaries and that today he's really seen as this, this eminent legal expert, which he was, but this was a collective effort. And so over time, and these commentaries have become very, very respected, and they've been cited by international tribunals, by domestic courts, in the legal scholarship often, and including by, um, by people who typically don't agree with the International Committee of the Red Cross in our positions. They'll often start the conversation by saying, what did Pique say, and go from there. And you can see again from those dates that this was very shortly after the conventions were concluded. These are the dates of publication in French. Publication in English followed approximately two years after each one. And that means that they were really still looking backwards at state practice, but importantly, state practice comes a lot more into these commentaries than it did in the previous ones. So back to the timeline of ICRC commentaries. Uh, after the 1977 additional protocols, uh, one commentary, they didn't get their own book each this time, but one single commentary on both was produced. It still went article by article. It was published in 1987. They brought back from retirement um, a, an ICRC lawyer who had been um, the, the, the Secretary General at the Diplomatic Conference, and he directed the project, although interestingly, he's not one of the three named authors on the cover. And there were a lot more people involved behind the scenes this time than just the authors that were named. Um, notably, the first woman who ever worked on a commentary was involved in this project, Sylvie Junot. Um, and she and, and others were present during the diplomatic conference for the 1977 uh, additional protocols. But notably, many members of this team had also worked on the Pictet commentaries. So that means they'd also had some experience with the 49 conventions. This was a post Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties commentary. So the, the legal framework as we know it today was, was there. 
Um, and, and they do cite the VCLT, but interestingly for definitions only, not really for its, its interpretive methodology. Here, the methodology was still trying to get at the intent of the drafters. And it's interesting to note here that for multilateral treaties, the intent of the drafters may not be the intent of states when they join the treaty, particularly when they join the treaty long after the conclusion. So it's interesting that that was still their thought on how to interpret the additional protocols. And last, because it's often forgotten and it shouldn't be, there's the third additional protocol of 2005, which did get its own commentary, although not a book. It got an article in the International Review of the Red Cross by ICRC lawyer Jean-François Keguinet. He was there as a member of the, delegate, of the ICRC delegation to that diplomatic conference as well. And again, it's an article by article commentary that, goes, that gets at the intent of the drafters. Um, it doesn't get into state practice because this convention, I think even till today has only been implemented one time. It established the red crystal, which has been used once in I think 2013 or 2014 by the Magen David Adom when they, when they were operating in the Philippines to respond to Hurricane Haiyan. And they put the red, red shield of David within the red crystal. But so there's not a lot of state practice even to this day. And so it really is based on the intent of the drafters there. So we see that from 1870 to 2006, these commentaries were issued by the ICRC or endorsed by the ICRC and issued by someone serving as an ICRC proxy very soon after the conclusion of the treaties concerned. It presented the ICRC's point of view, um, getting at the intent of the drafters. They were drafted by people who were involved in the negotiations and present at the diplomatic conference. Um, and that the, the sort of credibility evolved from being based solely on the reputation of a single author and their credibility of their opinions to a more institutional, a little more rigorous um, methodology that draws from real world experience increasingly over time. So these are our, update, our beautiful updated commentaries, uh, three of which have already been published in the, and the fourth is forthcoming, hopefully in 2024. Uh, then we'll move on to the 77 additional protocols. Um, and here, I think it's, it's good to, to think about the fact that there's still article by article commentaries, but the methodology necessarily had to change because none of the, the authors of these commentaries were present at the diplomatic conference. Um, but also some of the logic behind the project meant that the methodology needed to change. And that is given how, well, and for that we need to ask ourselves, given how respected and how well accepted the Pictet commentaries are, why would we want to mess with them? Why would we update these ICRC commentaries? And the most important reason is that those commentaries were looking back at practice by states before the conventions themselves. They weren't applying the articles of those specific conventions. There's been 70, more than 70 years of practice since then applying these specific articles. And so that needs to be taken into account. And so we, and, and also to take into account the developments of law and technology, including communication technology and language that's happened since then. So thinking about an example of how the language has evolved, uh, we can look to the word honor, which in the 1940s and 50s was just used a lot more. It was used in the sort of uncomfortable way of women's honor being associated with sort of sexual purity or their their moral value, but it was also used as a substitute for human dignity in some cases. And we see that particularly in the third Geneva convention where they talk about the honor of prisoners of war. Um, and then lastly, there are changes in just how we understand things. And one thing that's, that's interesting to look at is in the area of health and medicine, where in the third Geneva convention, uh, prisoners of war are entitled to access to tobacco. And today, given what we understand about the health effects of tobacco, that wouldn't even be in line with the Geneva Convention's uh, requirement to provide a healthful environment um, for prisoners of war if it were an unrestricted right of access, set, let, let alone the sort of health requirements under international humanitarian law or national 
law that there may be restricting tobacco use by age or even prohibiting tobacco use in public buildings. Also, our understandings on disability and gender roles have changed. And um, because these conventions have been applied to real people in real circumstances since 1949, states have had to take that into account. And we want to consider that practice as well. So the project, I'm running out of time, so I won't get so detailed into it. It was started in 2011. Uh, one of the things that's important to note about our methodology um, before we get into the Vienna Conventions on the Law, Convention on the Law of Treaties really briefly, is that it involves a lot more external input than any of the previous commentaries. Uh, we have an editorial committee that's made up of three internal ICRC legal experts and three external legal experts, one of whom is in the room, Lisbeth Linda. Um, and we have external authors as well as about 50 peer reviewers for per, per convention. So that means that we're keeping pace with the, the standards of academic rigor of the day. Um, we're also trying to get a bit of um, geographic diversity in the input to the, to the conventions because our peer reviewers are selected not only on their expertise, but also with an eye to geographic representation. Yeah. And now the, the heart of our interpretive method, which I'm not going to embarrass myself by explaining in too much detail the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties, to this audience in particular, but I will try to answer the core question, do different interpretive rules apply to international humanitarian law than other bodies of law and talk about some of the specificities. So the short answer is no, um, but no, but. So th this body of law does apply in in uh, armed conflict, and sometimes that's pointed to as, as sort of in, an ex in the presence of an existential threat, shouldn't the law be different or should there even be law? But this body of law was really designed to apply in those situations in a Westphalian mentality, right? So these treaties came from a West, like a fundamentally Westphalian theory where states are at the center and they are making these agreements. Um, and they, they were already baked in the, the, the fact that they would apply an armed conflict is already baked in. Um, the changes in the ICRC's interpretive methodology that I have talked about track shifts in standards of legal scholarship over time and reflect also the development in the law of treaties. Um, so interestingly, as it's become more complex, so have we, our methodologies become more rigorous. And although there's been some criticism as we publish these updated commentaries by states and by some scholars of how we apply the Vienna Convention of Law of the Treaties, importantly, there's been no criticism in that we apply the Vienna Convention of Law and Treaties, which for us, we consider customary international law, although I guess that could be debated with this crowd in particular. Um, so so the, the short answer is no, but there are some quirks or specificities in how that could affect how these rules of interpretation are applied. Um, so just to go through a few of them, like many international treaties, this is a multilateral treaty that's intended to be norm setting, it's erga omnis, and, and to quote Ian Sinclair, finding a common intent for multilateral treaties can be likened to finding gold at the end of the rainbow. So like I mentioned before, for these multilateral treaties, states join them for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they join them long after the fact. And so getting at that common intent or even the, the, the object and purpose can be difficult. And it necessarily means that that object and purpose will evolve over time. Also affecting how we identify the object and purpose of these treaties is the overarching purpose of international humanitarian law, which is to balance the, the principle of military necessity against the principle of humanity. And so that can inform how these treaties are interpreted according to the VCLT. The third particularity of the Geneva Conventions uh, that affects um, the interpretation of these, of, of their interpretation um, is their universality, which makes it very difficult to identify subsequent practice in the sense of VCLT Article 31. Um, because the, they're universally accepted, every single state would have to engage in a subsequent practice in order for it to fall under Article 31 versus Article 32 subsequent practice. That's very technical, but a fact. Uh, and something similar will happen for the additional protocols since they are so widely accepted. 
Um, and lastly, there's a high number of Jews Kogan's norms contained in these treaties as observed by Abi Saab and, and Kolb and Delmar. Um, so this can affect the suetude, uh, a word that's very scary to say because I've only ever seen it written, um, because it can these norms can only be replaced by another recognized use Kogan's norm. And my time is up, so I'll leave it there, but there's time for questions at the end. Many thanks, Ellen, and also being such a, a, a virtuous, such a virtuous conference goer and sticking to time. I'm sorry because it was clearly compressed and but we, we will have a chance to explore it, but it was a wonderful, um, a wonderful presentation. Now I I uh, we have found our lost professor from cyberspace. So with your indulgence, we will I think give him the floor. I, I believe technologically he will somehow appear. And uh, as you know, we're very lucky to have Professor Paolo Pinto de Albuquerque, who comes from the Catholic University in Lisbon. So welcome, Professor. And uh, he will be speaking to us on uh, the role of the European Court of Human Rights in the development of international criminal law. And Professor Albuquerque, of course, has a particular qualification because he was, in fact, a judge of the European Court uh, finishing his nine-year term just two years ago. So uh, welcome, Professor, and over to you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Okay, good. <clears throat> Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you. Unfortunately, I could not join you physically because of other professional commitments, but um, I could not uh, say no to the invitation of my dear colleagues uh, from the University of Groningen. Uh, now, let me make it short and go straight to the point. Uh, the dialogue between uh, international human rights law and specifically between the Strasbourg Court's uh, case law and international criminal law has been some, somehow uh, erratic. Um, ICC law um, has been a way of promoting human rights standards on the one hand, and here I would refer to two major cases, uh, Mocano and others versus R Romania and, and Margus versus Croatia, and you'll see uh, uh, quickly why I refer to these two cases uh, later on. Um, and but on the other hand, there's also this trend of using ICC law and specifically international humanitarian law within international criminal law as a way of subverting human rights standards. And here I refer to three uh, extremely important cases, uh, Assan, the Chechen cases, uh, the Chechen case, uh, case law, and of course, Georgia versus Russia, the second um, interstate case between Georgia and Russia. Uh, at the end, I would have to conclude that uh, we cannot have um, a necessarily optimistic understanding of this dialogue. Uh, we should be more prudent. Um, it is true that um, in the past, uh, the Strasbourg case law um, has, has um, incorporated many of these standards and has been a way of promoting also these standards of international criminal law. And within international criminal law, uh, more specifically international humanitarian law, there are very good examples of this positive dialogue, such as the case law on the statute of limitations in war crime cases and crimes against humanity cases, which borrows heavily from um, our law uh, within, within the, the framework of international criminal law. For instance, uh, the Convention on the Applicability of Statutory Limitations to War Crimes. And this has been the, at the core of the discussion uh, in Mocano and others versus Romania. This case is extremely important because it established this principle according to which there should not be a time bar for the prosecution of uh, these kinds uh, of crimes, war crimes and crimes against humanity, as well as torture, even when they have been mislabeled as ordinary, so to say, ordinary crimes, uh, time barred ordinary crimes. The same positive interaction is true for the courts, the Strasbourg courts, <clears throat> sorry, case law on amnesties and pardons. Um, war crimes 
cannot be pardoned, <clears throat> sorry, or amnesty. Um, uh, even when this pardon or amnesty has gained the force of rejudicata, the, the rejudicata can be reversed. And this was the main message of, of Margus versus Croatia, which again borrows heavily from international criminal law um, principles and, and even art law, such as uh, the ICC statute prescription of fraudulent res judicata. So these are welcome developments of this, interp uh, this uh, interpenetration and cross fertilization of, of, of these two fields of law. Uh, they prevent fragmentation in a, in a context of legal pluralism and they facilitate the common understanding of fundamental principles. So they are welcome. But there's also a less positive side of this um, dialogue. And I will refer to the court's case law, the Strasbourg case law <clears throat> in the Chechen armed conflict cases. This case law has had problematic practical consequences. In addition to undermining the absolute necessity test in Article 2 cases, I refer to the European Convention, of course, Article 2 cases, it condones military attacks in the absence of an immediate threat, which is extremely uh, dangerous. The lowering of Article 2 protection in internal armed forces is compounded by the fact that the court fails to define civilians, combatants, or indiscriminate weapons, seemingly assuming that those concepts should be understood as in international uh, humanitarian law. Furthermore, the court does not put forward a comprehensive analysis of the nature of each individual armed conflict to justify the applicability of a specific set of rules uh, under international humanitarian law. By so doing, the court does not differentiate properly between armed conflicts and other military operations such as anti-terrorist operations, which had occurred in the Chechen armed conflict all along with uh, the international uh, conflict and, and the internal conflict. And thus the court incentivizes political maneuvering by the contracting parties, as we have seen later on in the political developments that I will refer to later on, uh, who are tempted, these contracting parties, are tempted to invoke such precedents of lower protection outside the context of an armed conflict. So he, extending this case law to, um, uh, to, the, <clears throat> to other contexts, other than uh, uh, international or internal armed conflicts, strictly speaking. It is true that the court has set out the general principle concerning the relationship between the convention safeguards and the rules of international humanitarian law uh, when dealing with the armed conflict in Cyprus. It was in Varnava and others versus Turkey, which by the way, we should recall that it's a case not about the substantive principles governing this uh, field of law, but about the procedural obligations. And yet the court went on to say, and I'm quoting the court, article two must be interpreted in so far as possible in light of the general principles of international law, including the rules of international humanitarian law, which play an indispensable and universally accepted role in mitigating the savagery and in inhumanity of armed conflict, end of quote. So um, the courts roundly rejected the opinion that international humanitarian law displaces the convention during armed conflicts, which was the position of many governments, including the, the British government. Instead, it established an overarching interpretative rule according to which, where possible, insofar as possible, according to the expression of the court, the right to life enshrined in the convention should be interpreted harmoniously with international humanitarian law, regardless of the fact that Article 15 had been invoked or not. The exact same principle had already been affirmed by the International Court of Justice, by the way, when it stated that, and I'm quoting, whether a particular loss of life through the use of a certain weapon in warfare is to be considered an arbitrary deprivation of life contrary to Article 6 of the Covenant, the ICCPR, can only be decided by reference to the law applicable in armed conflict and not deduced from the terms of the Covenant itself, while at the same time rejecting the notion that the provisions of international humanitarian law would completely disapply the international covenant 
on civil and political rights. The same position was later echoed by the Human Rights Committee and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Um, it is true that <clears throat> the majority of the colleagues at the Strasbourg Court have uh, proposed a, a view uh, according to which if states have difficulties in uploading their Article 2 obligations during armed conflicts at home or abroad, inside or outside Europe, they have only one way out of this difficulty, this practical difficulty. It's, it's, it is to derogate from the convention and to comply with both the uh, Article 15 proportionality clause uh, and the other in obligations under international law, namely with international humanitarian law. Yet um, in Assan, um, the courts uh, did not really um, kept uh, faithful to this, uh, to this position. Um, it is true that in Assan, the state's practice of not making such a derogation led the court to conclude that the absence of a formal derogation under Article 15 of the convention did not prevent it from taking account of the context and the rules of international humanitarian law for the purposes of extending uh, the scope of Article 5 in a situation of an, inter of an international armed conflict outside Europe, uh, such as the Iraqi conflict. The court added a caveat, according to which the provisions of Article 5 so it limited the scope of this uh, extension to Article 5, will be interpreted and applied in the light of the relevant provisions of international humanitarian law only when this is specifically pleaded by the respondent state. Um, so the majority in Assan rendered Article 15 in a way futile as regards the right to liberty in times of international armed conflicts outside Europe, uh, putting forward um, uh, a reading uh, of the exhaustive list of grounds for detention are in Article 15 that, in fact, contravenes not only the black letter of the provision, but also its spirit. You have to recall that this is an exhaustive list, and yet in Assam, this exhaustive list was interpreted in an expansive way. So the expansive interpretation of, the, of this exhaustive list uh, of, of grounds for detention, uh, in fact, um, contravened the spirit of the norm. Um, the fact that the Assam majority interpreted the list of grounds for detention under Article 5 of the Convention as including the right to detain someone under international humanitarian law uh, does not allow the court to read into the exhaustive list of grounds for depriving someone of the right to life, Article 2, which is a different right. Uh, the right to kill in conformity with international humanitarian law. So the court was confronted with this dilemma of extending Article 2 as it has, uh, had done with Article 5, in spite of the restrictive uh, scope of, of these two articles, um, uh, has, has been confronted with this dilemma in, in, um, um, in the... Um, uh, in the Russian case, in the, the inter, interstate case between um, between um, uh, Georgia and Russia, the second uh, uh, Georgia versus Russia case. In this case, neither party to the convention gave notice of a derogation under Article 15 of the convention in the context of the armed conflict which broke out between them in August 2008. Accordingly, uh, in the absence of a formal derogation on Article 15 by the Russian Federation in the context of the present, uh, of the then present uh, uh, international armed conflict, its convention obligations under Article 2 were fully applicable, independently of, of any uh, reference to international humanitarian law. Consequently, the acts of war committed by the Russian uh, uh, Federation resulting in death constituted in, uh, in principle a violation of Article 2 of the Convention as they could not be justified under Article 2, Paragraph 2. Um, I regret that the court failed to engage at the merits stage of the procedure, in this case, with the most important legal issue at stake in the case, which was 
whether the uh, bombardments of the villages of Karbi and Tortiza and the town of Gori in August 2008 by the Russian armed forces amounted to a violation of Article 2 of the Convention. The reason why the court evaded this question, this delicate question, was, and I'm quoting the argument from the motivation of the court, was that the very reality of armed confrontation and fighting between enemy military forces seeking to establish control over an, uh, an area is a context of chaos, end of quote. And this, in the view of the majority, excluded jurisdiction. My view and the view of, of some of my colleagues, um, Judge Shenturia, Judge Yudkivska, Judge Wojticek, is that if detaining and killing a person abroad triggers jurisdiction as the court admitted in Turkish cases, in Cypriotic cases, killing many more people, uh, such as uh, in these bombardments, cannot exclude, of course, not a, a jurisdiction, at least personal jurisdiction, regardless of any element of proximity uh, between the state agents and the targeted population. It is not because the state acts far away from its borders that it can do abroad what it cannot do at home. The distance between the location of the alleged human rights violation in the national territory is irrelevant for the purposes of determining jurisdiction under convention law. Um, the absence of a, an Article 15 derogation has obviously uh, nothing to do with, uh, with jurisdiction, as the court itself had previously admitted, for instance, in Assan. Um, so uh, the, the majority position is here somehow irrational, I would say, because the, the graver the state, what they argue is that the graver the state military conduct and its consequences, the less intensive this, this, uh, the, the, Stra the Strasbourg oversight should be. Um, I have difficulties with, with this approach, um, nor it does uh, help to argue that the court's jurisdiction should be determined by the practical difficulties it may face, as the majority uh, has argued in, in this uh, Georgia versus Russia second uh, interstate case, um, uh, so they argued that on the basis of the practical difficulties that the court would face when dealing with a large number of alleged victims and contested incidents, or, or, or with the magnitude of the evidence produced, in some with, with the difficulty in establish, uh, establishing the relevant circumstances. In my view, and my other colleagues uh, that I have, have written separately, it is inconceivable that the court should delimit its jurisdiction, jurisdiction not in accordance with the legal criteria set out in, uh, in the convention and basically in article one, uh, but uh, in view of possible future procedural or technical complications in gathering and evaluating evidence. Moreover, the court itself has long since adopt, adopted rather successful techniques of evidence gathering and evaluation in complicated military situations. Um, and there is no reason why these same techniques should not be applied uh, in the context of an international armed conflict as the one in Georgia versus Russia, second interstate case. It looks like that the court is, was intentionally running away from trouble forgetting that the maintenance of, peep, uh, of peace was one of the most important, if not the most important goal of the founding fathers of the convention in Rome, as its preamble so forcefully shows. Um, so um, Georgia versus Russia, the second interstate case was a golden opportunity to affirm the legal force of the convention during the hostilities phase of the international armed conflict. Um, and for the development of this dialogue with uh, international criminal law. Unfortunately, the court missed this opportunity and we are now paying the price for that. The, we now see the consequences of this choice in the Ukrainian conflict. If the European Commission recently came forward with this idea of a special court to try this conflict, it is precisely because the European Court of Human Rights did not want to be this court, did not want to be competent for this kind of conflicts, and especially for the hostilities phase of an international armed conflict. I can only regret this development 
because in my view, again, it failed um, the main basic funda foundational um, goal that the uh, uh, founding fathers of the convention uh, wanted it to be. Um, and in that regard, I think it failed the most important uh, task that the court uh, should develop in Europe, which is the maintenance of peace. Thank you so much for your questions, if you have any. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Albuquerque, for that uh, very uh, that call to arms. If I can, uh, well, that's probably yeah. the wrong metaphor here, but uh, but for the very rousing talk you've given, I understand that um, it would be convenient for you if we took any questions now. Yeah. yeah. So I'll just uh, look at my audience and see whether there's uh, a question or two before we release you. Oh, yes, please, please, Panas. Thank you very much for Is it? Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, the very interesting presentation. Um, one question that I would have is that you essentially discussed that there is an optimistic and a pessimistic uh, version of this dialogue uh, between the, the two bodies of law. Um, so then, um, what would be your suggestion? So how, if, if, the, if the court, as you say, is, is running away sometimes, uh, how do you think that that can be prevented, essentially? Is it, is it more about legal reasoning in the judgments, more legal reasoning, or is it something that goes much, much uh, deeper there? And how can that be resolved, rather than ex post facto describing a situation but not being able to give a solution? I think it's, uh, if I may, I think it's a question of judicial policy. I think it's um, it's a, uh, a question ultimately uh, of the judges uh, at the Strasbourg court uh, uh, choosing um, not to run away from, from trouble and from complicated issues like, like the intersection between uh, human rights law and, and uh, international criminal law, which is a, a very delicate in itself. It's a very delicate issue and specifically when we you deal with international humanitarian law, uh, there is some also uh, some lack of expertise uh, um, in this specific uh, field of law, international humanitarian law. So um, sometimes um, in view of this uh, lack of specific expertise, also the judges are not uh, fully um, uh, at ease uh, with 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 this uh, dialogue, so they avoid to 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 have a very proactive uh, approach to this to these kind of of um, uh, um, uh, problems. Um, my view is that um, uh, more dialogue is needed. More dialogue is needed, and and uh, the more initiatives like this one, uh, um, uh, the better, because because they 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 uh, bring together. Um, uh, people working uh, um, in these two um, fields of law, and by talking to each other, they they are uh, made aware of the importance of sharing standards of of of, of coming to to a, a universal standard of protection of human rights, be it in uh, international or internal uh, armed conflicts. Um, what I experience in 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 the court is that uh, international lawyers, such as Judge Simula, they feel very at ease with with these issues, and they they can do this um, very easily, and they approach this very easily. But judges that uh, do not have an international law background or uh, um, an international criminal law background, um, they do not feel uh, at ease, so they avoid uh, to 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 tackle these problems. Uh, and this is this is a pity, really, uh, it, because. The court is, in my view, failing its its most important task. Thank you. I'm conscious I can see some questions that have come through in the chat. Um, oh, okay. The one flashed up. Yes, one 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 did flash up. I'm. 
But perhaps, perhaps it was a comment. I don't know, Professor Albuquerque, whether, whether you can see that. Yes. Oh, yeah, thank you. We'll, perhaps we'll uh, make this the last yes, question. Yes, a short you. question. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Pindo. It's very inspirational, your uh, uh, presentation. I would like to ask whether you find any similarities in this difficulty that uh, you criticized about the court uh, when we have um, uh, issues uh, about um, conflicts at the time we, we have to decide whether there is a jurisdiction or not, uh, comparing with the cases under continuing occupation. Uh, will you find uh, similarities in the way the court looks at these cases? And of course, I'm, I will imply the case of Cyprus where we have some issues creating uh, different, I would say, uh, decisions uh, from the court side in the beginning and today where we are still facing the continuation of the uh, occupation there. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, it's, it's, it's absolutely, it's this, this difference that you introduced is absolutely crucial. So uh, the, the court refrains from uh, accepting jurisdiction in the active hostilities phase of an international armed conflict, but it accepts uh, jurisdiction uh, during uh, occupation. Uh, this is the, the big difference in, in the court's case law, in the Strasbourg uh, case law. And, and in my view, the active hostilities phase is no less important, on the contrary, than the occupation phase. Uh, and the, 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 um, uh, the, um, the court did not provide a, a sufficiently um, convincing um, justification for not applying the same principles in the active hostilities phase and in the occupation phase of an international armed conflict. So it, it made this difference, but it did not justify the difference convincingly, other than uh, invoking arguments uh, such as the, those that I mentioned of technical nature, of procedural nature, difficulties in, in uh, evidence gathering and, and, uh, and arguments of that sort, which has to me, are definitely not convincing. Uh, thank you. There is a question uh, that has uh, come up. I'm not sure if you can see it in the chat, Professor Pinto, but it says, I'll, I'll read it to you. What weight should be given to European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence, which relies on IHL rules to establish jurisdiction primarily versus international criminal law courts, which engage directly with norms. Uh, yeah. Um, so, and then, then the comment is, well, you could, you could substitute the word uh, authority for weight. So what authority should be given to European court jurisprudence versus um, international criminal law courts engaging directly with norms? This dialogue between uh, uh, the international uh, human rights courts and um, uh, more specifically uh, the European Court of Human Rights and, and um, uh, the ICC and other uh, international criminal um, uh, criminal law courts um, it, it has been unfortunately a unilateral, mostly a unilateral um, uh, dialogue. So it's it's it has. Uh, been a, a one-way street in the sense that um, the court um, um, only uh, sporadically uh, uses uh, the, 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 the jurisprudence of, of the ICC or other international uh, criminal courts uh, in, in, in the specific field of, of jurisdiction with regard to the specific uh, question of jurisdiction. Um, it's it's um, the other way around that works. Uh, it's it's more the the the, the ICC and the, the international criminal courts, uh, which are really more dependent on on the the, the European uh, courts case law. And and this has to change. Of course, it should be a two way street, and the dialogue should be in in both ways. Uh, uh, and I see it as an enriching development uh, that. Uh, um, these two grand chamber cases that I mentioned, Mocano and and um, um, uh, and uh, the Croatian case, um, uh, have, have really uh, gone in that uh, uh, in that direction. Um, 
uh, of, of um, uh, using um, the case law of uh, international uh, criminal courts and even not only case law, but also soft law, um, uh, uh, standards of, uh, of soft law uh, for um, establishing, first for establishing jurisdiction and then for coming uh, to to come to come to a, a violation in that in the, in those two specific cases, um, so it's 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 a dialogue that uh, has to has really to grow into something uh, more uh, more uh, of a two way street, uh, which is not really yet there. Thank you, Professor Pinto. I I think at that point we should probably stop the uh, questions because we need to move on to our final panelists. But in case you need to go, uh, allow me to thank you very much for this, this thank you so terrific much. presentation. Good. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. So I'm delighted our, our, our third speaker, and I'll just remind you, we'll take questions of both Ellen and Vasilka afterwards, uh, has come to us from Ljubljana in uh, Slovenia. And I understand, uh, so Professor Vasilka Santin, uh, this is an important day in terms of her biography, I understand, because she's listed as the Vice Chair of the UN Human Rights Committee, which she was until yesterday. But as of today, she's uh, now, she's uh, becoming a member of the Advisory Council to the UN uh, Human Rights Council. So she had to give up um, the last month of her position. So uh, congratulations, let me say, it's wonderful that, to know that your involvement with the Geneva Human Rights Organizations will, uh, will continue. So uh, uh, Professor Santin is a professor at the University of Ljubljana uh, in Slovenia and has somehow uh, managed on the side. She told me her university considered her work on the Human Rights Committee as a hobby, uh, <laughs> a weekend sort of hobby, as if that would be possible. But um, yes, she, she clearly has a very interesting perspective where she served as vice chair of, uh, of that committee. So welcome, and we hand over to you. Thank you for this very kind introduction, um, Judge. And it's a pleasure to be here. And I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Panos, Sotirios, and all the crew behind them. And it does feel that these uh, Greek um, international lawyers are omnipresent because, as you know, I have served uh, until the end under the Greek chair of the Human Rights Committee, uh, Madam Pasartis. So I am also very thankful to Judge Zimele because she has done such a nice introduction and many of the things she said, of course, apply also to the work of the committees established under various UN human rights treaties. But I dare to say that um, unlike, as you have explained, you do see some coherence and consistency in jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights um, and the Court of Justice of the European Union. I, I dare to say that we cannot argue that there is really coherence and consistency in the jurisprudence of the human rights um, treaty bodies. And perhaps there are reasons for that. Uh, one of them probably is that the states parties prefer to keep flexibility and um, versus uh, legal certainty, which might be justified also by the fact that the human rights treaty bodies do not have the mandate to adopt legally binding decisions. So the legal certainty perhaps is then less um, uh, relevant or less affected as in the case of, of course, binding judgments of the courts. And perhaps um, what is also important to mention that although I am supposed to speak of um, the role of the committees in interpretation of the UN human rights treaties, um, this obviously is an oversimplification because the committees themselves are very different from one another, also in terms of their composition. There are certain committees which are composed mostly of lawyers. This is the case of the Human Rights Committee, which I will focus more on in my presentation. But of course, there are other committees where perhaps other profiles of experts uh, prevail. And that, of course, also then affects uh, how they conduct, the committees conduct their work. Um, 
Perhaps um, a final preliminary mark, and it goes to what uh, Josh Charlesworth mentioned. These um, treaty bodies, of course, are non-permanent uh, mechanisms. So um, all the experts work there on top of their other um, commitments. Nevertheless, they do have a significant workload, especially in the case of Human Rights Committee. I can uh, tell you that in this year, the committee has adopted, um, it's a record number, that's why I'm mentioning, over 200 decisions on basis of individual complaints. And despite these extreme efforts of uh, the committee members, as well as the Secretariat in Geneva, there is a huge backlog uh, of uh, cases before the uh, Human Rights Committee. There are over 100, uh, I'm sorry, 1,000 cases waiting to be decided. And there are certainly more incoming cases each year than the committee is able to um, assess within uh, a year. So. To conclude, <laughs> the system, I think, is unsustainable as it is. Um, we will see if certain developments uh, will bring changes to these statistics, because I don't know if you know, but uh, unfortunately, yes, last month, yes, now we are already in December, last month, um, one of the... <sighs> important clients of the Human Rights Committee, that is Belarus, decided to withdraw from the optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, meaning that, um, of course, there will be three more months where individuals from the state party uh, will be able to uh, submit individual complaints, but then no more. So the, the largest number of cases were coming from this particular state party. However, there is already a um, detectable increase in communications coming from another state party to the Covenant, which we all know left the Council of Europe uh, this year. So there are more and more also communications coming from individuals uh, in the Russian, from the Russian Federation. Uh, having said all of that, let me focus now a little bit on what I think is interesting uh, from the perspective of the how committees engage um, with the rules of interpretation. And um, as I said, I will mostly focus on the Human Rights Committee. Some of these things apply also to other committees, but not necessarily all. And I think um, just to mention, I think this audience, of course, knows uh, that there are 10 um, such treaty bodies in existence. At the moment, um, eight of these have the mandate to receive individual complaints. Um, they all conduct reviews of uh, states' parties' compliance with their treaty obligations under their respective treaties. And um, most of them also adopt and issue uh, general comments and or general recommendations, because in certain committees they're called general recommendations. Now, it's difficult to, to say where it is mo most appropriate to start with general comments or reviews or individual communications because they're all somehow interrelated when it comes to how the committees adopt um, the stance towards the important rules to keep in mind when interpreting the state parties' obligations. And I'll explain what do I mean by that. As Judge Zimele already said, the human rights treaties are a bit uh, specific in terms of the subject matter that they regulate. And of course, um, they are, I think, especially receptive to evolutive, evolutive interpretation because they contain generic terms where their meaning can and does evolve over time. So I will not focus that much on how states parties uh, interpret these treaties, but rather how the committees uh, do engage in such interpretations. Now, I think um, what is um, interesting to say is that there are a lot of opportunities for the dialogue with the state parties um, by the communities. Uh, they can engage in such discussions, of course, uh, during um, periodic reviews. Um, now, just the decision was adopted that these periodic reviews will take place every eight years for all the committees. This is an important novelty because until now, some parties were appearing more or less regularly, others uh, 
less so or never, and the committees agreed this year, all the chairs of all the committees agreed that all the committees will now proceed with the so-called eight-year predictable review cycle, um, meaning that the Secretariat in Geneva is now trying to establish a calendar uh, for all these reviews, which will in a way lessen the burden on the state parties with reporting, but also ensure that really all the state parties will be regularly reviewed, whether they appear before the committees or not. And when I say that um, it's regrettable that we see also some, some instances where the state parties do not appear before the committee when they're scheduled for review. The Human Rights Committee in its last session, now in October, November, reviewed two state parties in absentia. Uh, namely Nicaragua and the Russian Federation. And we can only hope that this is not uh, a trend that will continue uh, going forward because it's very important for the state parties to be present during the review to engage in, of course, the experts of the committee. Now, um, the question that I think is important is to what extent the committees um, really de facto develop the interpretation of substantive rights under the respective treaties, and how are these um, interpretations received domestically within the respective state parties' legal order. Um, and I think it is relevant to start with general comments first, um, because the general comments should in principle be based on the practice of the relevant committee, both in terms of uh, conducted state reviews and recommendations issued in concluding observations, as well as in cases of committees where such a mandate exists on the basis of the decisions adopted based on submitted individual complaints. That is the idea, that the committees should develop general comments in order to guide um, the states in, their, in the application of their treaty obligations, taking into account the existing practice um, of the committee as it evolved. Now, this has not always been possible because there are certain instances where there is very little or um, really very limited um, practice available. And in these cases, the committees have sometimes gone well beyond, <laughs> let's say, uh, what the um, strict interpretation of the treaty text under the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties uh, would um, provide for. And there is no doubt, of course, that uh, the covenant is um, to be interpreted according to the general rules on treaty interpretation as embodied in the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties. The committees have recognized that the Human Rights Committee has done so very early on in Alberta Union case and many times thereafter. Um, so the question is, what is really the value of these interpretations provided by the committees in their general comments or general recommendations uh, for the state par parties. Um, so again, being very um, gen gen general, over generalizing the issue, I think we need to distinguish between general comments adopted among different committees because even the process itself is very different. Within certain committees, the general comments um, are initiated um, after an extensive, let's say, discussion within the committee and interactions with various other stakeholders, also civil society organizations, and then the decision is adopted. And then there are also extensive consultations with states parties, which I think are also important, and other stakeholders in the development of the general comment. And then the general comment is adopted if the committee works very fast within two years, or let's say four, four years. Other committees adopt several general recommendations within one session. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the pace is very different and consequently also engagement with uh, the um, states and their uh, inputs into what then finds a way into the general comments. Um, and there are also different approaches from the state parties as to 
how do they perceive these general comments domestically? There is no doubt that as such, the documents are not legally binding. General comments uh, can at most be considered as authoritative interpretations if we are very um, generous. And uh, however, some states actually domestically do uh, perceive general comments as having a legal way for their domestic uh, jurisdictions. For example, I was, um, it was interesting for me to, uh, when I was working on one case before the committee that was brought against um, Norway, to learn that for Norwegian courts, the general comments have to be followed uh, in their domestic interpretation. So it was uh, interesting that the greater weight is ascribed to the general comments than derives from uh, the relevant treaties themselves. Um, and um, also the style and structure of these general comments do not uh, follow uniform approach. Uh, some are really more policy oriented, some are more uh, phrased in legal terminology. Um, so, and they are addressing, as I said, very, very different issues. Some committee have also started practice of issuing joint general comments, uh, trying to synchronize also a little bit the practice among different committees, tackling issues deriving from basically the same rights um, uh, pertaining to different perhaps groups of individuals or individuals. Um, and again, what is interesting to, to note is that none of the core human rights treaties contain any common provision establishing the legal basis for adoption of the general comments. Um, so it's really kind of uh, um, subject to the, 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 the ideals that are transmitted to the committees uh, that generate sufficient interest within the membership that will then a result in adoption of uh, a relevant general comment. So uh, there is no system, you see, there is no prescribed system of how the committees will adopt um, these general comments. And this is perhaps less known among the general public because there can be a great influence um, on the committee how to proceed with interpretation even of certain rights under the covenants or other uh, human rights treaties. Um, and why did I start with general comments? Because although they are, as I said, not legally binding or do not have any um, special force, let's say, under the respective treaties, the committees then regularly refer to these general comments when examining states, when conducting their monitoring function. So when issuing recommendations, you will see that the committees regularly refer to general comment this and that, calling upon the state party to adopt certain measures or legislation or change its interpretation and so on. The same with then decisions on individual complaints. The committees regularly refer to general comments as a source of interpretation of the state's obligations under the respective treaties. So you will see in many of the footnotes, you will find references to general comments um, when interpreting what should have been the uh, correct application of a certain obligation of the state party uh, based on the alleged violation of the author who submitted uh, this complaint. Also, regional bodies seem to ascribe great weight to um, general comments of uh, the committees, um, even the European Court of Human Rights uh, reference general comments. I can mention the case of Perinček versus Switzerland, for example. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights also uh, refers to general comments. Perhaps the case in, in uh, relevant case would be Poblete Vilches and others versus Chile from 2018. But of course, also the International Court of Justice does uh, refer to general comments of the committees and the case of Ahmadou Sado Diallo um, is of course very pertinent from 2010, uh, where the court said that the Human Rights Committee has built a considerable body of interpretative case law. So the court explicitly recognized that this is interpretative case law. Um, and also the court said, although we are not obliged to follow this interpretive case law in the exercise of the judicial function, 
um, it, uh, it, it makes sense to model the interpretation on the covenant um, on that committee's basis. Uh, because it carries great weight. I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing now what the court said. So said great weight should be ascribed to the interpretation adopted by this independent body that was established specifically to supervise the application of that treaty. Um, and then um, I've of course, read with great interest one article that was forwarded to me by um, the organizers of the conference, uh, where Kirsten Schmalenbach, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, argued in her article, Acts of International Organizations as Extraneous Material for Treaty Interpretation, that uh, the committees do enjoy considerable respect and influence as guardians of the treaty, but also that a wealth of pronouncements of the scope, understanding, and dynamic developments of their um, respective human rights treaty inevitably leads to disagreement over the interpretative value of these pronouncements and views, which was fueled by, she says, equivocal stance of the International Court of Justice. She emphasizes uh, the wording that I mentioned in the Diallo case, and then she refers to the decision of the court in the case of application of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, where the court narrowly interpreted Article 1 of the Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination and its term national origin, deviating from the uh, third committee's broader understanding of the term. So uh, she says that um, what is important that uh, no meaningful subsequent um, state practice exists on which the independent expert body can build its assessment and it is reduced to making interpretative offers to persuade state parties to share a certain understanding of the law, which the latter may or may not accept by way of subsequent practice. So she speaks of interpretative offers. Now, I would like to just quickly, I know that my time is up, and I, I will just very, very quickly mention one case in particular, and that is the recent decision, fairly recent decision of the Human Rights Committee in the case of Billy and others versus Australia, where the court had, uh, the court, the, Europe, uh, the Human Rights Committee had the possibility um, to pronounce something on the applicability of the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties also, and I think it's interesting, the authors brought the argument that the climate change treaties um, are important for examination of violations under the covenant, the state party uh, under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, Article 31. The uh, state party disagreed, obviously, with this assessment. And then the committee stated, and I wish to just read because I think it's interesting. While taking note of the state party position that the extension of Article 6 of the Covenant to Right to Life with Dignity through General Comment Number 36 is unsupported by the rules of treaty interpretation with reference to Article 31 of the Convention, Vienna Convention, the committee is of the view that the language at issue is compatible with the latter provision which requires that the treaty be interpreted in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the term of the treaty in the context, object, and purpose. The committee notes that under Article 31 of the Convention, the context for interpretation of a treaty includes in the first place the text of the treaty, including preamble and annexes, and the preamble initially recognizes that the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world, and further recognizes that those rights derive from the inherent dignity of the human person. So while the state party knows that socioeconomic entitlements are protected under a separate covenant, the committee observes that the preamble of the present covenant recognizes the, the ideal of free human beings enjoying freedom from fear and want can only be achieved if conditions are created 
whereby everyone may enjoy their civil and political rights, as well as their economic, social, and cultural rights. So you see, because the general comment number 36 on the right of life introduced very clearly and specifically and expressly this idea of uh, right, with, um, right to life with dignity, the committee now went back to the origins, to the preamble, and uh, interpreted the meaning of this preamble in light of the rules under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And finally, and this will really be my last sentence, the um, Human Rights Committee, while um, reviewing uh, Japan in the recent um, session, uh, also had the possibility to engage with the state party delegation on the relevance of general comments and the member of the delegation clearly stated that they give instructions to their domestic um, judges uh, how to interpret human rights treaties based on general comments. So while this perhaps uh, is, is uh, too soon to, to, to celebrate, the general comments will become kind of a guiding rule for interpretation of the relevant human rights treaties. And as I said, perhaps per approach of states might differ as does the approach of the International Court of Justice to different treaties. This uh, still is, I think, a relevant um, development um, from the perspective of the human rights committees. Thank you very much. And apologies for being too long. Thank you, Professor Sanchin, for that uh, fascinating talk. I, I don't know whether to feel. Um, my country seems my own country of nationality has long taken this view, uh, I think, on um, general comments. So I'm not sure whether to celebrate their consistency or despair about their inability to move. But um, it was a wonderful talk. So now we have a few minutes at least. I look to the organisers who will allow us to intrude into the lunch hour a little. Yeah. But um, the chance to ask both um, Ellen and Vasilka uh, questions or comments about uh, about their talks so hi I, thank you so much for the panel and I have a question since the keynote speech uh, my name is Elisa Morgera from the University of Strathclyde in Scotland uh, and the question is whether in in the practice you've been involved but also your own personal reflections on a potential tension between state practice and good faith interpretation and how if you're able to detect those instances how have you been navigating them and whether you have some thoughts for others in navigating those tensions. Thank you. We might just see if there are other questions and then we can. Uh, yes, please, Judge Linsa. Well, thank you very much for all the presentations uh, um, and uh, thank you. Um, uh, for speaking about the commentaries, which is an impressive project, but uh, let me address my question to uh, the final speaker. Thank you very much. I felt that was very uh, illuminating what you said. Now, um, may I um, raise which something that's perhaps a bit of a cynical question. Um, there have been many comments uh, about the quality of quality of the membership of some of those supervisory committees. Um, not all the committees are full of lawyers, some are not, which is sometimes visible in the general recommendation, general comments that have been formulated or in the way in which how uh, the committees have dealt with uh, individual complaints. I'm not saying I share those comments, I just want to make that caveat first. However, um, there is something where I get, I get the feeling that it is a bit about the translation of those, the value of those documents, particularly the general comments and general recommendations, when they drift into an area, as you mentioned briefly yourself, where they are perhaps more political documents than legal documents. Um, when that happens, and I would say that at times that has happened with the Women's Committee, which was at one point full of lots of experts in many things concerning the position of women, but lawyers were really in a minority. Um, there is something problematic about having that authority to write these general comments and general recommendations and how they will then be used in legal practice 
when the content borders on perhaps being more of a political message. Um, I don't want to get into the whole discussion as to what is political and what is legal, but uh, you get my point. But maybe you could comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. I might just slip in a question for Ellen, if she'll allow me. Um, I, I love the idea of a school of interpretation. You know, we were in the room, um, <laughs> which uh, I, I've, I've, I've uh, heard more than, more than once. Um, but uh, I think because we had this, this wonderful overview of different approaches um, from Judge Simile this morning, I was just thinking, is there, or in your observation, given you in this particularly, you have a great vantage point, um, uh, a view that Judge Simile say found in the European Convention of a thing, of the Geneva Conventions being living documents, does that does that come through at all? Because the way that you outline so uh, carefully, you know, the different things that are being factored into it, peer review, you know, reviews of state practice. But what about, say, these, these perhaps grander ideas about it being written documents? So I'll just add that to your list of questions. So if, if there are no, oh, please, let's, let's add, if, if our two panelists don't oh, mind so, being- Sorry for adding more yes. time before lunch. Um, no, 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 so no. my name is Anna Venderato. I'm from the University of Sheffield. I have just a quick question for Ellen. Um, you made towards the end of your speech a very interesting point about um, uh, the Geneva Conventions being, as I understand it, designed to apply in situations of crisis. So um, I understand that you imply that this has some consequences also potentially for the interpretation of such treaties. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on this argument. So I understand about defenses, termination, potentially suspension, derogation clauses, but in terms of interpreting those treaties, does this have any kind of consequence in how we approach the text, perhaps? Thank you. Thank you. So perhaps uh, I'll now hand over to our, uh, to our panelists. And the advantage of having so many questions is you can work out which bits you want to answer. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you can pose questions to each other as well. But Ilna, over to you first. Great, maybe I'll, I'll start with the tension between state practice and good faith interpretation. I think here um, the, the, there's perhaps a, a, a repeated criticism of international humanitarian law since the very beginning, since the first time that the first Geneva Convention was applied, that these rules are violated, therefore, do they matter? And I think that's interesting because all legal rules are violated at some point in time, and for other bodies of law, this doesn't seem to come up as often. And it's curious that for international humanitarian law, each time it's violated or due to maybe the the amount of violations that are reported, it, it, it's constantly being questioned in that way. And so I think there we need to acknowledge that some of state practice will just be in violation of the law. And that's also state practice, but it doesn't affect the interpretation of the law. We've also had some, some pretty vocal states argue that they're specifically affected states because they're major war fighting powers. And to me, this is also quite a cynical argument because all states are capable of being affected by armed conflict. All states can engage in armed conflict and states that engage in armed conflict less often don't have less of a seat at the table because of that. They're still parties to these conventions and they still have a role and an important role to play in practice, um, specifically under common article one, but also in other measures that they can take already in peacetime. And their interpretations are equally important. And so I think there it, it emphasizes the fact that it's important for states to speak up and it's important for scholarship to speak up as well, um, to, to state interpretations clearly, um, especially where they disagree with some of these very vocal states. Um, and, and then to go on to the Geneva Conventions as living documents, uh, definitely these are the types of, of norm setting multilateral conventions that lend themselves particularly well to being seen as a living document and to evolving over time. And in the drafting history, you can already see that states and others involved in the drafting process knew that when they were doing it. They, they even say at a few points, oh, we, we shouldn't be too specific because this practice will probably evolve. And so I think that's quite interesting that they knew at the time it was, it was already baked into the treaties that they intended for them to evolve. And again, states join them at different points. So today the Geneva Conventions are universal, but they weren't universal in 1949. And even those who joined early on had probably differing understandings of the intent behind the convention. So that object and purpose will 
necessarily evolve and we should look at it at the moment of interpretation because of that. And so it's very much a living document. And then lastly, to go on to this design to apply in crisis point, I think one thing that's already in the treaties in, in, in their articles is that, that a state can't um, unbecome a member <laughs> during an armed conflict, that, the, that even if they were to pull out of the treaty, it would apply to the end of the conflict. Um, and th that they're, they're non-reciprocal in application. So that means that there's no, that you can't, um, respond to a violation of the Geneva Conventions with a violation of the Geneva Conventions as you may be able to under other treaties. So those sorts of things. Also that this is just, again, a very common, very cynical argument that we get that these are really existential situations where the normal laws wouldn't apply or in the sort of traditional understanding of, that predates the Geneva Conventions that during armed conflict, the law falls silent. And that's not the case. These conventions were drafted by people who had just survived a world war. They knew what they were doing. They knew what kind of pressures that the law would come under and, they were, and it was designed for that. So it's not that this is a particular situation where we should say the law is, the law is doesn't apply. And, and in that vein, it's interesting to note that there are no derogation clauses in the Geneva Conventions. Thank you. Okay, sorry, just Yes, thank you. So I think the good faith question was very interesting because if we take it that the um, treaty bodies, the human rights treaty bodies um, have the mandate, let's say, to interpret the treaties, as I said, there are different views on that, uh, then, you know, it's uh, also we need to ask um, whose good faith are we looking at? Because if the treaties and not the states also have the power to interpret, we're looking at then the good faith of uh, members of the committees, right? The experts sitting there. And I'm mentioning that because oftentimes, uh, and I speak now really from my experience, uh, when you are deciding on the committee, you see that individual members um, interpret certain uh, rights, um, uh, referring to the good faith that has to be followed um, in such interpretations. And then you have very simplifying again, uh, a group of members who are more conservative as Judge Similar was speaking and others who are more activistic perhaps. And they say the activistic ones, um, you know, we are interpreting the treaty in good faith, kind of uh, suggesting that the conservative members are not interpreting the, um, what is expected from these treaty bodies in good faith. So it's very interesting, but in principle, of course, I think it's important for the committees and I have to also admit that this is so in practice, uh, they are very well aware that they need to first of all um, apply really the rules of the Vienna Convention and take into account also uh, the state's um, positions on, on certain issues. But of course there are certain cases and especially in, in separate opinions, sometimes this is visible when members go beyond. The committees also are deciding by consensus. So it's, you know, again, trying to find the minimum common denominator when deciding on, on, on the outcome of decisions. Quality of the committees or their composition and how this um, impacts decisions on individual complaints. Um, I, I will not go into that because it would take us too long. Of course, there are very different situations and uh, perhaps uh, reasons why the state parties put forward certain candidates and then the whole election mm -hmm. procedure, which has turned into vote trading, but that applies to other uh, organs of the UN as well. But I would also like to mention that the problem of these committees, I think, with this increasing uh, workload is the serious um, underfunding and therefore understaffing of the uh, secretariat in Geneva, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, that is supposed to support this committee's work. And lack of digitalization. Judges uh, at the court probably cannot imagine that you would now have to work still with all the physical files that is the case of the committees where individuals you know, working in the secretariat are trying to find various parts of the communication all over the offices and at their homes and so on. So it's, it's a huge mess. 
the state parties have committed some funding for the so-called digital uplift of the treaty bodies, which has been ongoing for several years. So hopefully uh, we'll see some results. They're promising some results next year, but when this will be possible also to manage and then perhaps we will have also greater coherence, greater consistency, and um, you know, the, 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 the also reasoning that will be included in the decisions will perhaps uh, improve because uh, it will be easier to, to follow on the previous jurisprudence and, and you know, have all the relevant elements at hand because the time is very, very limited. And finally, because in some works um, that I also read before joining the committee and I agreed with those who said, the committees do not uh, sufficiently reason their decisions. They spend too much uh, space on presenting the facts and then too little on uh, presenting their arguments why they adopted a certain uh, view on the matter. But you see the problem of these committees is really the word limit. <laughs> this has been for me the biggest frustration working on the committee because each document is limited to 10,700 words. Huh? This is the limit that you cannot uh, go beyond. And of course, when the case is very complex, and usually they are because they had to exhaust all domestic remedies before coming to the committee, right? You need to prepare, present relevant facts. And then very limited space is uh, left for the actual reasoning. And the same applies for the separate opinions. So the length of the separate opinion is determined by the length of the decision of the view, right? So if there is little space left, then you get as a member who wants to write separately, 300 words. What can you explain in 300 words? So in these four years, I have spent much more time shortening my separate opinions and trying to decide, you know, which word is less important and take it out just to fit within this word limit. So this is uh, also perhaps uh, part of the reason why uh, sometimes you would wish for more legal reasoning uh, in the decisions of these human rights um, treaty bodies. I hope I have answered all the questions. Uh, more political, uh, yeah, perhaps just this one, yes, um, that the, some general comments are more political documents and how are they to be um, considered? As I said, I think we should just... Um, in the current uh, state of uh, the organization of these treaty bodies, uh, differentiate among different treaty bodies and within the same treaty body among different uh, general comments and take some of them more as political, I mean, more as policy orientations or, um, you know, let's less, less. Uh, what some authors have called a persuasive body of jurisprudence <laughs> kind of uh, character. Yeah, that would be my reply. Thank you. Well, I'd like to, on your behalf, thank our, our wonderful uh, panelists. Uh, you've had that. I've, I've must say, I've learned a huge amount. I'm. I think the issue about the word limit, I'd never appreciated that issue. So I just hope that the court up the road doesn't get uh, wind of this. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, it's uh, I think from both, I think what's been wonderful about um, both our panelists who are still here is the fact that they are steeped in the practice of these organizations, but also have an academic perspective. So it's been, it's been marvelous. So I think it's probably, I'm sure it's lunchtime, and I don't know if you'll be given an extension on the lunch hour by our kind organizers, but I'll, I, I won't go into their jurisdiction. I'll, I'll just leave that. But just uh, please join me in thanking uh, our <laughs>